I'm not going to say I hate to tell you, but I'm going to say I'm glad to tell you I don't think it's going to be long now until that event right over there, that red arrow, happens. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and uh, it could not come too soon. Amen. Um, mm. But uh, as you read and study not only this book but other passages, you realize that just like the uh, angel said in chapter 10, which we'll get to, time is getting short. Time is getting short. Okay, last week we were in chapter 9, which talked about the sixth trumpet. And I, I did not fill in my board over here. I'm, I apologize for that. The, the sixth trumpet, it parallels the sixth vial, which you read in chapter 16. We may make comment about that in a little bit. Uh, we looked at the results of the fifth and the sixth trumpet of chapter uh, 9. And the results, the results were these. The first result was a spiritual result. In verse 20... Uh, there was no repentance. They kept doing the. Uh, uh, they kept worshiping the evil things that they worshipped. They would not turn their their eyes toward God, and there was no repentance. That was a spiritual result. Physical result was seen in verse twenty one. Uh, they repented not of their evil deeds, things they were doing that were uh, sinful, they repented not of, of that. Matter of fact, in chapter 16, the, um, the sixth vial, which talks about the same event, it says not only did they not repent, but they blasphemed God, they cursed God. Uh, so, no matter what God did, they rejected they repented not. Uh, as I was studying this, I couldn't help but think of Job and all the troubles he was going through physically, mentally, emotionally. And his wife gave him the advice, curse God and die. And I, I, I just, that just came to my mind when I saw these uh, the results, the reaction to what God was doing was basically that. Um, rejection of God requires repentance. Uh, let, me, let me mention something about <coughs> repentance. Repentance is a change. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an about face. It's a turning away. It's a turning toward. Uh, repentance is required when someone or some group rejects God. And that has to change. See, um, A lot of people uh, don't, don't realize, but when man rejects God, God requires repentance. Now we understand that repentance is not required for salvation because that is a work. But if someone consciously, deliberately rejects God, then they need to repent. Now God, if He calls them, will enable them to do that. But uh, did you know, by the way, that all men will repent? <coughs> Did you know that? Uh, there's a verse that says that all should come to repentance. Did you know that all men will come to repentance? If it's not in this life, as they stand before God, they will bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's better to do that in this life than later but it will happen 
Yes. But that doesn't mean, like, after this life, when they repent, it's too late. Oh, yeah. Then. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. It is. It, it, there is, after this life, no chance to alter one's eternal destiny. Uh, that is determined in the life in this life. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we have, is there conclusions? Does anyone have conclusions about this? All the things they went through in the fifth trumpet, in the sixth trumpet, and yet the, they repented not and just gritted their teeth and went away from God. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? As to why they, yes? Well, they're not atheists anymore. Well, they're not something. because they're blaspheming God, aren't right. they? Right. To reject some, to reject God, you have to accept that He exists. So that's at least a step in the right direction. <laughs> well, it's it's a reaction. Yeah. It's a reaction. Yes, sir. Um, if I'm thinking of the verse you referred to, uh, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right. Um, he says to us, word. I think it's Second Peter three nine. It is. Is it is it not limited to believers? Well, that verse is uh, definitely limited to whoever us word is. Second yeah. Peter three nine, right. and the us word happens to be the Jewish believers, the Jewish uh, believing Israel. Uh, it says that all through those two books, First and Second Peter, he contrasts the Gentiles and the Jews. When he's speaking, obviously, to the Jews because he refers back to the other people, you know. So, yes. Um, okay. By the way, that's the most taken out of context verse in, in the Bible. But we shall go on. What can turn men's hearts to God? I think about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, uh, uh, it was told the rich man that his brothers would not believe even though one rose from the dead. Wow. So what can turn men's hearts to God? God. There's one answer. God. Yes, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must work. The Holy Spirit works and He quickens the dead spirit of that individual so that there can be communication with God. That doesn't happen. Uh, man will always go away from God. Man's nature is to reject God and after many many years of blaspheming the Holy Spirit even if the Holy Spirit I mean I've struggled with this a little bit because I think God truly wants all men to repent but the Holy Spirit if it's rejected over and over again you may never be able to get through to that person. Well, they quench the spirit. Okay, they yeah. definitely did. It always concerned me that Israel's got this pillar of fire by night and, the, and, and they're following God, and yet they still fall off. And it blows my mind how we can do that in our own lives um, all the time. Sin uh, creeps in. Right. And I'm thankful that. I accepted Jesus, but I, I don't understand if God really wants somebody, he's going to get them, right? I mean, he's going to call them and it's going to work. Yeah. Well, what about, what about uh, uh, the Apostle Paul who was called Saul, right? Mm -hmm. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest and kill believers and you know what happened boom God got a hold of him <clears throat> and 
he was not going to stop unless God stepped in. Okay. Yes, sir. Don't you believe that, that the reason for that was that uh, uh, I lost my thought. <laughs> but uh, you have to excuse me. But you keep saying about men. What about women? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So if rejection of God requires repentance, does that put those Gentiles in the same category as the Jews who have to repent? When it, and if they all have to repent and the Holy Spirit's bond, how's that going to work? Well, uh, mostly we think of repentance as a national thing. If you apply it to a, an individual spiritual thing between man and God, God is going to have to start that work because the very fact of repentance is a result, say, of God's working. Not a cause of his salvation. Don't you believe that Paul's conversion was that the lowest of sinners can be saved? Yeah. When you think about it, he was a murderer and Yes he was. He was he called himself the chief, chief of sinners. Uh, and yet yeah. uh, it's all about man's nature. What nature do we have? It's a sinful nature that man has. And he every choice he makes because of his nature, he chooses it. God gives him a new nature, guess what? He, 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 he then makes choices on the basis of his new nature. But it's still his choice. Okay, now, uh, we're, we've, we've run that gamut enough. Let's move on to the aftermath of the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet... Uh, after that sounds, the population is greatly reduced. Personally, I feel like there are, are it's down to 10, 20 percent maybe. Now I realize that uh, the 25 percent is taken, and then the third of what was left was taken to give us a uh, an official cut of half the population. But there's other things going on here too. Uh, beside that, men are dying left and right. By the way, when I say men, I include women. <laughs> the population is greatly reduced. Unbelievers are confirmed in their rejection of God. When God does the fifth and the sixth trumpets, you can see that confirmation, that rebellion that's in their heart. Uh, However, believers have been protected. Believers have been protected. Uh, this is something that uh, some have not really gotten into the study, that during the tribulation, <laughs> believers are protected. Now, we understand that the 144,000 have a seal of God on them that they cannot be killed. Uh, we know that many will die as martyrs that are not part of that group. Mm -hmm. However, the believers are protected through these things that are aimed at the ungodly. See? They're aimed at the wicked. Um, we'll see about that in chapter 11. Mark 16, right at the end of Mark 16. I do what, let me flip over there to it. I don't even have it marked. I hope I, I can find it in time. Mark 16 um, talks about the uh, preaching that will occur during the tribulation period. In other words, before Christ comes back. They've already asked him, what is the sign of that coming? See? And the end of the world. And so he tells them some stuff that's going to happen. And look what it says. Uh, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Now this is not for this day and age. It is not for the church age. But it is for the tribulation period. In my name shall they cast out devils. 
They shall speak with new tongues. In other words, they miraculously can spread the gospel even to people that they don't know the language. It will go all around the world. <clears throat> Verse 18, they shall take up serpents and if they serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. Remember during the tribulation period the waters will become bitter. Okay. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. A lot of gifts will be seen and it says they that believe these signs follow them. So believers during this tribulation period here are going to have gifts, abilities that we as members of, of the church today do not have nor need. See? But this will be one of the sign, uh, signs of the end times. And believers will be protected. Doesn't mean they won't be killed because there's a lot of martyrs. Okay. Uh, and by this time, battle lines have been drawn. The world is set up for the return of Christ. It's all there. Way, I mean, it's just right for the people. The next event is going to be the seventh trumpet. We've had six trumpets, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh trumpet is the return of Christ. In chapter 11. Yes, sir. In Mark, Mark 16, uh, you look around different parts of the country and the world, uh, that, a lot of people attribute that to today. We have this fellowship in front snake handlers in, in my part of the country, Tennessee, Virginia, Kentucky, uh, that hold in on that uh, verse, and we also find faith healers that hold in on Mark 16. They attribute that to the present time. Right. That's, that's uh, improperly applying scripture, <coughs> wrongly dividing it. Uh, anyway, uh, the seventh trumpet will be found in chapter 11. Now, we go to chapter 10, if you look at chapter 10, this is a what we call a parenthetical chapter. In other words, it's stuck between the 6th and the 7th trumpets. So the, uh, the Lord said, okay, I want to shoot this information in here for you, just kind of as a side thing, but I want to put it in right here. So I want us to look together as we, uh, we read this chapter. Verse 1, And I, that's John, <coughs> saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head and his face, whereas it were the sun and his feet pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things therein that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, that's the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, 
Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said, Take of it, take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Very interesting chapter. Very interesting. People are going to say, well, this is that and that is this. And they try to really categorize the items and the people in this chapter. Let's look at it and, and see what we can come up with. We notice that it's placed between the sixth and seventh trumpets and that the seventh trumpet is the return of Christ. Although this is parenthetical, it does come before the end of the tribulation period. Because if you look at verse 6, it says, he declares that time should be no longer. In other words, time's up, folks. You had your, your time and your time is over. Um, so uh, this chapter is sometimes called the mighty angel and the little book. You know, you see the mighty angel and the little book as the title of the chapter. The description of the angel is given in verses 1 and 2. And as we read that, uh, we saw some very interesting things. Uh, we see that this likely refers to Christ. Remember, Jesus was referred to in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, an appearance of the Lord. And it's my personal belief that it is talking about Christ here, the mighty angel. And uh, notice associated with him a cloud, rainbow, sun, pillars of fire, a lion, a loud voice, a thunder. Uh, all of these things point to God. And He is God. He is God the Son. And I believe it's just talking about Jesus Christ here. Uh, he's got His right foot on the sea and left on the earth. I believe that is speaking that He has authority over everything. There. Uh, I heard one preacher say, well, he's, as the sea is probably the Mediterranean and the earth is probably Palestine, and different guys say different things. Um, Any way you look at it, it's a big step. I mean, it, I, I kind of look at this as Jesus is ready to come back. The seventh trumpet is about to sound. And remember, when that happens in chapter 19, the heavens open, the seal glass itself parts. I believe Christ places his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. And he is Lord of everything see, in between. I, it's, it's, it's a tremendous picture of him as the authority over the entire creation. Um, now Jesus will make an appearance sometime before the end of the tribulation period to Israel and they will recognize him as Savior, Messiah, and Jehovah. We'll find that he appears to them somewhere in this time when Israel is in the wilderness. Ezekiel 20, among other places, he appears to them, pleads with them face to face to accept him. They recognize him and they believe on him at that time. And the nation, Isaiah 66, is born in a day. It's like they were born again in a day. 
That's where God writes the law in their hearts, put a new spirit in them, gives them a new heart, causes them to be able to keep his commandments, and they uh, then are ready to go into the land. Uh, but this appearance, we don't know exactly when it is. It's somewhere probably near, near the end, but not right at the end. Uh, <clears throat> This mighty angel that we see in chapter 10, in verse 4, it talks about the seven thunders. Do you see in that verse where after he speaks, there are seven thunders? Now, if you look up the word thunder and thunders and thunderings and all that in Scripture, you get a lot of interesting things uh, that happen. But uh, these may refer to another series of judgments that occur during the tribulation period. In verse, uh, in chapter eight, verse five, uh, you see that before the trumpets sound, they have uh, lightnings, thunderings, voices, and an earthquake. So these thunderings might be another series of, uh, of judgments issued by God. But we don't know because he's commanded don't write what you just heard. Um, this may be God's thoughts and words that are being expressed uh, as John hears them. And uh, Job 40 verse 9, Psalm uh, 29 uh, is all about that. I like this one in John 12. I'm going to read that to you. In John 12, uh, Jesus is getting toward the end uh, of his ministry. And um, in verse 28, uh, he says, uh, he's praying, Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. That's the Son talking to the Father and vice versa. Verse 29, the people thereof that stood by heard it and, and said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. In other words, they recognized that God was speaking. And that was His words. And they may not have understood the words, but they got it. Many times in Scripture, you speak, uh, you hear of God speaking, and it's as thunder. You had said that maybe another series of judgments, and then you mentioned earthquakes and whatnot. Where, where would that be at? Um, uh, well, uh, that was mentioned in chapter 8, verse 5. Oh, I'm sorry, it's right there. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, this, this is just, you know, it could be, it could be. Uh, we don't need to get into it because John was told not to write it. I mean, really, uh, I think John wanted to write that down, the words that were spoken. Uh, but God said, don't. Uh, remember when Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, he got stoned out of, uh, they carried him out of Lystra and stoned him, and I think they killed him. And he said, I can't tell if I was in the body or out of the body, but when he opened his eyes, he was in paradise, he said. And he saw things there. And... He was not permitted to write about it, what he'd seen. John was permitted to write about what he saw when he uh, got into heaven, not about this. Uh, so sometimes God allows men things that he does not want uh, others to, to read about. We don't know. Maybe we'll find out someday. That'd be a good question to ask. What did those thunders say? What was all that about? We don't know. The angel's oath. In verse 5 through 7, the angel swears. Swears. 
Now, if you look up the word swear in scripture, you know, your concordance, you'll see there's a whole lot of swearing going on in the Bible. Uh, and I, when I looked it up, I see two places where God swears. This is one of them. The other place, uh, well, first of all, let's get into this. Notice that he is swearing by the eternal creator. Now, if this is Jesus speaking, he's swearing by the eternal creator. Now, we know the creator is Jesus because in John 1 through 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So he is the creator. And we also know that he is eternal. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is eternal. So we have Jesus Christ swearing by the creator, the eternal creator, who he is. Why, why would this happen? Well, the first time it happens, we read in Hebrews 6.13. Hebrews tells about when God made a covenant with Abraham. You remember in Genesis 15, the, the pieces of the animals were placed along and Abraham went into a deep sleep and did not have to walk between the pieces, but the Lord himself did. And so God swore to Abraham, but he swore by himself because there was no greater than he. So when God made this oath, this promise to Abraham, it is something that is a sure thing. So notice, Jesus Christ does the same thing as Jehovah in the Old Testament. Guess what? They are one and the same. Um, we see uh, two things that he swears in this chapter. He swears that man's time is coming to an end, verse 6, and that God's mystery will be finished, in verse 7. <clears throat> he says man's time is coming to an end. The times of the Gentiles that Jesus spoke of in Luke chapter 21, I think, um, <coughs> the times of the Gentiles would be ending right here at the second coming. So when uh, he says that time was no longer to be, boom, that's it. Man's time is up. From then on, Christ will reign on the earth. Uh, Daniel 9, uh, Daniel 12, verses 7 through Nine talks about the uh, about the same thing, and God told Daniel, "Hey, because Daniel's he wrote all this down, but didn't understand it." And God said, "Don't worry about it. Seal up the book until the time of the end. Then it will be open." See, well, it's the same thing. This will be open right here. The little book will be open. Alright, and also his promises to Israel will be fulfilled. If you look at verse 7, it says that the mystery of God should be fulfilled as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Who did the prophets speak to? They spoke to Israel. Isaiah. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, those guys were talking to Israel. And he says, it's going to be fulfilled now. So you can picture this angel, the Lord, standing up saying, it's happening now. So as 
as the mighty angel speaks, the next thing that happens will be the, the seventh trumpet. But let's look at the little book. <laughs> Everybody said, what in the world is the little book? Uh, and he didn't really tell us what the little book was. It's not identified. John's commanded to eat it. Um, most of us would like to know what we put in our mouths. Uh, I think some of us knew what we were eating. We wouldn't be eating some of the stuff that we eat. <laughs> like sausage. <laughs> we don't know where that's been, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, John's commanded to eat this little book. Oh, uh, well, what is it? Uh, some people say, well, it could be the book of Revelation, because he's writing it. Uh, it could be the Word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16 writes, Thy word was found, and I did eat them. And thy words were unto me the joy and rejoicing of my soul, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So Jeremiah talked about eating, feeding on the word. Paul talked about that, the meat of the word. Peter talked about that, the milk of the word. So God's word is to be spiritually consumed by us because that is how we grow. Right? <coughs> That's where we get our nutrition. Uh, notice it was sweet the mouth. Psalm 115, 119, 103, like honey in the honeycomb. Uh, it's sweet. There's nothing, there's nothing that is sweeter than getting along with God's word and realizing that this is the Creator talking to you, talking to me, as we read His Word. That's a fantastic book that we have. That's a miraculous book that we have, and it's sweet in our mouths. But John also said that after he ate it, it was, it was bitter as it hit his belly, as it went into his stomach. Uh, it was bitter. I think of uh, Hebrews 4.12 talking about the word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God can be sharp. It, it is sharp. And it can cut and it can heal. Uh, but God's word convicts. And sometimes conviction is not a pleasant thing as we see our lives compared to what God says our lives should be. So the Word of God can be bitter in that we see ourselves and we become sick at our stomach at what we are allowing in our lives. And this is what John, uh, this is what John experienced. Um, in verse 11 it says, John, you're going to prophesy before peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And we know that John did because this book has gone all around the world. And his book is the very last book in the scriptures, in the book of Revelation. So he prophesied and has prophesied all around the world. How many books can you get on Revelation commentaries? How many sermons can you hear on Revelation? Uh, and, and as people are talking about it, it's all over the world. It's even in movies as the, what was the name of the movie? Left Behind. Left Behind. And other, other dramas are presented and we see the world is sort of beginning to focus on the end times. And so John has had a worldwide influence in what he wrote, what was given to him to write. Okay, enough about the mighty angel in the little book. I want to have just enough time to give you your assignment for next week. We are in chapter 11. We go to chapter 11.
And of all the chapters in Scripture, this could be the most consequential, pivotal, revealing chapter. And as we get into studying, studying it, you'll see why I say that. But I want you to read chapter 11 for next week. Uh, I'm going to give you a summary of it here, and you can look at this summary, and as you get, as you see this, maybe it will help as you read it. There are four distinct sections in this chapter. They are, verses 1 and 2 talks about the temple, and it's the physical temple in Jerusalem. It's not the temple in heaven, as we will see. It is a temple in Jerusalem during this time. Guess what? It's not there now. But it will be there. We'll, we will look at that next week as we get into it. Second section talks about the two witnesses, verses 2 through 12. And... Um, I'll have a sheet to pass out to you next week telling you who I believe it is and why I believe it, it, it <coughs> they are them. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not right. Um, anyway, uh, this details their three and a half years of preaching, which will start here at the midpoint and go three and a half years. <coughs> the last half. The third point, uh, the third section is the second woe is completed. Now that is sort of the tail end of the, of the sixth trumpet. So this is kind of wrapping up all of the, what has happened in the, in the trumpets, the sixth trumpet especially. And the second woe will be completed. I, I kind of will refer to that as the drum roll. You know how before something happens you have that... You know, and then the guy, oh, say, and, you know, <laughs> and, he, and he starts playing that on the trumpet. Uh, you see that a lot of times. Oh, I, at least that's the way we did it and when I was on the football field in the band. They had that drum roll, you know, and then we'd start playing. Uh, so I kind of kind of look at these two verses as the drum roll to what's about to happen. And then the final portion, verses 15 through 19, is the seventh trumpet and what follows it. The seventh trumpet and what follows it. Uh, those verses right there, those five verses, 15, 16, 17, five verses are very, very important because they give a chronological uh, revelation of what will happen and in the order that it happens. Very clear, very clear. And it's uh, uh, that's five verses that are very seldom uh, preached on or taught on but we're going to look at it and I want you to look at those verses and study them and see what you think about this chapter okay alright we're kind of moving fairly quickly we're not dragging our feet too much um, and I realize that we can't take verse by verse and cover this in, you know, in a reasonable period of time but we're getting the high Okay. Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We do thank you for the plans that you have for the future. Lord, we thank you that we are in your plans and that we have been since the foundation of the world. We have been in your plans. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing 
in our lives. We pray that we will be faithful to you. Lord, help us to honor you in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we think. In Jesus' name, amen.